This book is dedicated to Danielle Antoinette, who transformed my life into a joyous adventure. Golden Fox by Wilbur Smith A cloud of butterflies rose into the sunlight, the breeze smeared them across the summer sky, and a hundred thousand young faces, shining with wonder, turned upwards to watch them drift overhead. In the forefront of that vast concourse sat a girl, the girl that he'd been stalking for ten days now, a hunter studying his prey. He had come to know with a peculiar intimacy her every gesture and movement, the turn and lift of her head as something caught her attention, the way she cocked it to listen, or tossed it in annoyance or impatience. Now, in a new attitude, she lifted her face to the glorious cloud of winged insects, and even at this distance he could see the sparkle of her teeth, and her lips formed a soft pink, oh, of wonder. On the high stage above her, the figure in the white satin shirt held up yet another box, and laughing, shook from it a fresh burst of fluttering wings. Yellow and white and iridescent, they bore aloft, and the crowd gasped and ooed afresh. One of the butterflies toppled and dived, and though a hundred hands were held out to catch it, it swerved and wobbled down to alight at last on the girl's upturned face. Even above the swelling murmur of the crowd, he heard the girl's happy cry of laughter, and he found himself smiling in sympathy with her. She reached up to where it sat on her forehead and took it gently, almost reverently, in the cup of her hands. For a moment, she held it close to her face, studying it with those indigo-blue eyes that he had come to know so well. Her expression was suddenly wistful, and her lips moved as she whispered to it, but he could not hear the words. Her sadness was fleeting, and then those lovely lips smiled again, and she leapt to her feet and held both hands high above her head, standing on tiptoe. The butterfly hesitated, perched on her outstretched fingertips, pulsing its wings softly on the point of flight, and he heard her voice, Fly! Fly for me! And those around her took up the cry. Fly! Fly for peace! For a moment she had usurped the limelight, and all eyes were fastened on her, rather than on the flamboyant single figure in the centre of the stage. She was tall and lithe, her bare limbs tanned and glowing with health. She wore her skirt so short in the fashion of the day that as she reached upwards the hem rose high above the circular creases where her cocky little buttocks joined her thighs in a froth of white lace. For a moment, poised like that, she seemed to epitomise her generation, wild and free and fay, and he sensed the instant accord of spirit of all those who watched her. Even the man on the stage leant forward to see her better, and his lips, thick and livid, as though stung by bees, split in a smile, and he called out, Peace! And his voice was magnified a thousand times by the great banks of amplifiers that rose high on each side of the stage. The butterfly flew from her hands, and she pressed all her fingers to her lips and blew a wide kiss after it as it fluttered aloft and was lost in the swirling cloud of insects. The girl sank down onto the grass, and those seated close to her reached out to touch and embrace her. On the stage, Mick Jagger held his arms wide, commanding silence. Once he had it, he spoke into the microphone. Distorted by the amplifiers, his voice was slurred and incoherent, his accent so thick that the watcher could barely understand the stumbling tribute he read out to the member of his band, who only days previously had drowned in a swimming pool during a wild weekend party. The whisper was that the victim had been almost comatose with drugs when he entered the water. It was a hero's death, for this was the age of drugs and sexual excess, of pot and pill, of freedom and peace, and overdosing. Jagger ended his little speech. It had been so brief that it had not dulled the buoyant mood of the gathering. The electric guitars struck a discord, and Jagger hurled himself into Honky Tonk Woman, with every fibre of his being. Within seconds, he had a hundred thousand hearts racing in time to his, a hundred thousand young bodies jerking and pulsing, and two hundred thousand arms held high, swaying like a field of wheat in a high wind. The music was cosmic, brutal as an artillery bombardment, 
painful to the ear. It penetrated the skull and seemed to numb and crush the brain. Swiftly it reduced the audience to a mindless frenzy, transformed the multitude into a single organism, like a gigantic amoeba that throbbed and undulated in the act of reproduction, fraught with a passion that was overtly sexual, and from it rose the stench of dust and sweat, the sickly odour of cannabis smoke, and the heady, overpowering musk of young bodies physically aroused. The watcher was alone in the midst of the throng, isolated and detached, unmoved by the blasts of sound that swept over him. He studied the girl, awaiting his moment. She swayed to the primeval rhythm, moved in time to the bodies that pressed close about her, but with a singular grace that set her apart. Her hair was glistening jet with highlights of ruby that glinted in the sun, piled on top of her head, but thick tresses of it had come down in smoky coils, enhancing the elegant line of her neck and the set of her head upon it, like a tulip on its stem. Directly below the stage, an area had been cordoned off with a low picket fence, a tiny enclave for a privileged few. Marianne Faithful, in a flowing caftan, but with bare feet, sat here with the other wives and camp followers. Her beauty was remote and ethereal. Her eyes seemed dreamy and sightless as those of a blind woman, and her movements slow and somnolent. Children crawled about her feet, and they were guarded and protected by a phalanx of hell's angels. In black Wehrmacht steel helmets hung with chains and Nazi iron crosses, chest hair curling out from under gillets of black leather studded with silver metal, steel-shod motorcycle boots, arms covered with intricate tattoos, they struck menacing poses, arms akimbo, billy clubs in their belts, and their clenched fists heavy with sharp-edged steel rings. They surveyed the crowd with brooding, insolent stares, watching for trouble, hoping for trouble. The music pounded on and on, an hour, and then another. The heat built up, and the smell of humanity was like that of an animal cage. For some of the audience, both men and women, hemmed in and reluctant to miss a moment of it, had urinated where they sat. The watcher was disgusted by the decadence, by the wild abandon and the gross indulgence of it all. It offended everything that he believed in. His eyes felt gritty and sensitive, and his head ached, throbbing in time to the driving rhythm of the guitars. It was time to leave. Another day wasted, another day spent waiting for the opportunity that never came. However, he was a hunter with all the patience of the predator. There would be other days. He was in no hurry. The moment must be exactly right for his purpose. He began to move, working his way across the low knoll, where he had stood through the dense throng of bodies. Shouldering through them, they were in such a mesmeric trance that they seemed neither to see nor feel him push past them. He glanced back and his eyes narrowed as he saw the girl speak to the boy beside her smile and shake her head in response to his reply, and rise to her feet. Then she also began to work her way through the crowd, stepping over the seated ranks, steadying herself with a hand on a shoulder, laughing an apology as she went. The watcher changed direction, angling down the gentle slope to intercept her, the hunter's instinct warning him that unexpectedly the moment for which he had waited had arrived. Behind the stage were the television trucks, row upon row of them, each as tall as a double-decker bus, parked so close together that there were only inches between them. The girl moved back, circling the low picket fence, working her way around the side of the stage, trying to get clear of the throng. But it was so dense that it blocked her further progress, and her expression was desperate as she glanced around her, caught in the press of bodies. Suddenly she turned directly towards the fence, pushed her way to it, and then with a swift athletic bound jumped over it and scuttled into the narrow space between two of the high television trucks. One of the Hell's Angels saw her dart away into the forbidden area, and he shouted and followed her at a run, twisting his shoulders to squeeze into the narrow passage down which she had disappeared. And as he turned, the Watcher had a flash of the grin on his face. It took the Watcher almost two minutes to force his way to the point on the fence where the girl had crossed. Somebody reached out to stop him, but he struck the hand away and went over it, and slipped into the space between the high steel sides of the parked trucks. He moved sideways, the gap too narrow to accommodate the width of his shoulders, 
and he was level with the door of the driver's cab when he heard the muffled cries of protest just ahead of him. The sound spurred him, and as he came around the side of the bonnet, he checked for an instant as he took in what was happening just in front of him. The Hell's Angel had caught the girl, and now he had her held against the front wing of the truck. He had one of her arms twisted up behind her back at almost the level of her shoulder blades. She was facing him, but he pressed her backwards against the steel wing with his hips and his pot belly. He bent over her, trying to reach her mouth with his. The girl's back was arched, and she rolled her head violently from side to side, trying to avoid his mouth. He was laughing, his mouth wide open, flicking his tongue out at her, trying to force it into her mouth. With his right hand, he had hoisted the tiny skirt up to her waist, and his hairy fingers, stained with motorcycle grease, were hooked into the waistband of her lace panties. The girl was striking and clawing at him with her free hand, but he hunched his shoulders so that she could not reach his face with her nails, and her blows fell on studded black leather and on thick shoulders padded with muscle and fat. The angel's laughter was thick and guttural, and the lace of her panties tore with a sharp crackling sound as he forced them over her hips and down the smooth tanned thighs. The watcher stepped forward and touched the angel's shoulder, and the man froze and twisted his head around. His eyes were glazed, but they cleared instantly, and he flung the girl sideways so viciously that she sprawled on the torn, muddy grass between the trucks. The angel reached for the club in his belt. The watcher reached out and touched him again under the ear, just below the rim of his steel helmet. He pressed with two fingers, and the angel froze and stiffened. All his limbs went rigid, and he made a glottal cawing sound deep in his throat. His entire body convulsed, and he collapsed in a heap, and like an epileptic, lay twitching and jerking spasmodically. The girl was on her knees, pulling up her torn underclothes, and watching in fascinated horror. The watcher stepped over the sprawling angel and lifted the girl to her feet without apparent effort. Come, he said softly, before his friends arrive. Swiftly he led her away by the hand, and she followed as trustingly as a child. Beyond the park trucks was a maze of narrow pathways through the rhododendron bushes. As they ran down one of these paths, she asked breathlessly, Did you kill him? No. He did not even glance around. He would be on his feet again in less than five minutes. You flattened him. How did you do that? You hardly touched him. He did not answer, but round the next bend in the path, he stopped and turned back to face her. Are you all right? he asked and she nodded jerkily without speaking. He studied her, still holding her hand. He knew she was twenty-four years old, a young woman who had just experienced a violent attempted rape. But the gaze of her dark blue eyes was level and appraising. There were no tears, no hysterics, not even a tremor of those pink lips, and the hand on his was slim and firm and warm. The psychiatrist's report on her, which he had studied, had been correct in at least this much. She was resilient and self-assured. Already she was almost fully recovered from the attack. Then he saw the colour mount softly in her cheeks and at the base of her long, elegant throat, and her breath quickened perceptibly. She was experiencing another strong emotion. "'What's your name?' she asked, her eyes fastened on his with an intensity which he recognised. Women on their first encounter usually looked at him like that. Ramon, he replied. Ramon, she repeated softly, relishing the sound of it. God, he was beautiful. Ramon who? You won't believe if I tell you. His English was perfect, too perfect. He must be foreign. But the voice matched his face, beautiful, deep and grave. Try me, she invited, and heard the catch in her own voice. Ramon de Santiago y Machado. He made it sound like music. It was impossibly romantic. It was the most beautiful name she had ever heard, perfect for that face and voice. We must go, he said, while she still stared at him. I can't run, she said. Don't make me run. If you don't, you might end up as a mascot on the handlebars of a motorcycle. Of a motorcycle. Of a motorcycle. Of a motorcycle. She laughed and then bit her lower lip to stop herself. 
<laughs> Don't do that, she protested. Don't make me laugh. I need a loo. My condition is critical. Ah, so that is where you were headed when Prince Charming fell in love with you. I warned you, don't do that. With an effort she smothered her giggle, and he took pity on her. There is a public loo at the gate to the park. Can you make it that far? I don't know. The alternative is the rhododendrons. Uh, no thanks, no more public performances today. Let's go then. He took her arm. They skirted the serpentine, and Ramon glanced back. Your boyfriend's ardour must have cooled, he said. No sign of him. What a fickle fellow. Pity. I love to watch you do that trick of yours again. How much further is it? Here it is. They had reached the gate, and she dropped his arm and started for the small red brick building that nestled discreetly in the shrubbery beside the path. But at the door she hesitated. My name is Isabella, Isabella Courtney, but my friends call me Bella, she said over her shoulder, and darted through the doorway. Yes, he murmured softly, I know. Even while she was in the cubicle she could hear the music, barely muted by the distance in the brick walls, and then the clatter of a helicopter passing low over the roof. But it was unimportant. She was thinking about Ramon. At the wash basin she studied herself in the mirror. Her hair was a mess. She tidied it quickly. Ramon's hair was thick and dark and wavy. He wore it long, but not too long. She wiped off her pale pink lipstick on a Kleenex, and then repainted her mouth. Ramon's mouth was full but masculine, soft but strong. She wondered how it would taste. She dropped the lipstick back into her bag and leant close to the mirror to appraise her own eyes. They didn't need drops. The whites were so clear they had a bluish sheen, like those of a healthy baby. She knew her eyes were her best feature, that Courtney blue, something between cornflower and sapphire. Ramon's eyes were green. They were the first thing that had struck her about him. That clear, startling green, beautiful but... She searched for the adjective. Beautiful, but deadly. That was it, exactly. She didn't need the demonstration that had felled the Hell's Angel. One look at those eyes, and she had known he was a dangerous man. She felt the back of her neck prickle with a delicious thrill of fear and of anticipation. Perhaps this was the one, at last. Beside his image, all the others seemed to pale and fade. Perhaps this was the one she had searched for so long. Ramon? To Santiago y Machado, she said in a throaty purr, savouring the taste of it in her mouth, watching her own lips form the words. Then she straightened up and turned to the doorway. She prevented herself from hurrying. Slowly, languidly, on the tall stiletto heels that made her hips roll as she walked and her bottom swing like a metronome, lace flashing under the abbreviated skirt, she went to the door. She pouted slightly and let her long, thick eyelashes droop over the blue as she stepped out into the slanting golden sunlight. And she stopped dead. He was gone. She caught her breath and felt the cold, quick slide of her stomach as though she had swallowed a stone. She looked around her in disbelief. Ramon, she said uncertainly, and ran into the pathway. There were hundreds of others coming down the tarmac path towards her, the first escapees from the concert trying to avoid the human avalanche that would soon follow. But none of them was the elegant figure she sought. Ramon, she said, and hurried to the park gates. The traffic boomed down the Bayswater Road, and she looked frantically right and left. She was overcome with a sense of disbelief. He had gone and left her. It was beyond her experience. She had shown him that she wanted him. She couldn't possibly have made it plainer. And he had walked away. Her next emotion was outrage. Nobody did that to Isabella Courtney, not ever. She felt slighted and insulted and very angry. Damn him, she said. Damn the man. Her anger lasted only seconds, and then it slumped. She felt lost and bereft. It was an alien sensation for her. He can't just leave like that, she said aloud, and recognised in her own voice the self-pitying whine of a spoilt child. So she said it again differently, trying to recapture her anger. 
but it was unconvincing. Behind her, she heard a shout of raucous laughter, and she glanced back. A bunch of Hell's Angels was swaggering down the pathway, still a hundred yards away, but coming directly towards her. She couldn't remain here. The concert was over. The crowds were breaking up. The helicopter she had heard must have come up to pick up Jagger and his rolling stones. There was little chance of her rejoining her friends now. They'd be lost in the multitude. She looked around her just once more, swiftly but despairingly. Still no sign of that dark, wavy head of hair. She tossed her own head and lifted her chin. Who needs him anyway, damn Dago, she muttered furiously, and struck out down the pavement. Behind her there was a chorus of whistles and catcalls, and someone, one of the angels, began calling the step for her. Left, right, left, shake, rattle and roll. She knew that her high heels were making her bottom waggle furiously. She hopped on one foot and then the other as she pulled off her shoes and then fled barefoot down the pavement. She had left her car at the embassy car park in the Strand, so she had to take the tube from Lancaster Gate Station to reach it. Her car was a brand new Mini Cooper, the very latest 1969 model. Daddy had given it to her for her birthday and had had it customised for her by the same body shop that had done Anthony Armstrong Jones's Mini. They had souped up its engine, upholstered it in white Connolly leather like a Rolls, and re-sprayed it the same glitter silver as Daddy's new Aston Martin, with her initials in gold leaf on the door. All the swinging set were driving minis. There were more of them than Rolls's or Bentley's parked outside Annabelle's on a Saturday night. Bella threw her shoes into the tiny back seat and revved the engine until the needle went into the red. The tyres squealed and left black smears on the ramp of the car park, as she glanced back at them in the rearview mirror, it gave her a dark, satanic pleasure. She drove with abandon, protected from the wrath of the Metropolitan Police by her diplomatic plates. She wasn't really entitled to them, but Daddy had wangled them for her. She beat her own record back to Highfelt, the ambassador's residence in Chelsea, and Daddy's official Bentley with its pennants on the wings was parked at the entrance, and Clonky, the chauffeur, grinned and saluted her. Daddy had brought most of his own staff from Cape Town. Bella controlled her mood long enough to give Clonky her sweetest smile and toss him the keys. Put my car away for me, there's a dear Clonky. Daddy was tremendously strict about the way she treated the servants. She could take her moods out on anyone but them. They're part of the family, Bella, and most of them had indeed been at Feltefrieden, the family home at the Cape of Good Hope, since before she was born. Daddy was at his desk in his study on the ground floor overlooking the garden. He had discarded his coat and tie and the desk top was piled with official documents, but he tossed down his pen and swivelled his chair towards her as she came in. His face lit up at the sight of her. Bella dropped into his lap and kissed him. God, she murmured, you're the most beautiful man in the world. Far be it from me to question your good judgment, Shaza Courtney smiled, but may I ask what has brought this on? Men are either bores or bores, she said. All except you, of course. Ah, and what has young Roger done to arouse your ire? To me, he seems fairly inoffensive, if not actually insipid. Roger was the one who had escorted her to the concert. She had left him on the crowded lawn in front of the stage, but now it took her a moment to remember him. I'm off men for life, Isabella declared. I shall probably hie me to a nunnery. Could you possibly eschew holy orders at least until tomorrow? I do need a hostess for dinner this evening, and we haven't yet arranged the seating. All done long ago, she said, before I left for the concert. The menu? Chef and I settled that last Friday. Don't panic, Papa. All your favourites, coquille Saint-Jacques and lamb from Camdebu. Shaza served only lamb reared on his own farms in the Karoo. The desert scrub gave the flesh a distinctive herby flavour. All the embassy beef came from his extensive ranches in Rhodesia, and the wines from the vineyards of Veltefrieden, where for the last twenty years Shaza's German winemaker had laboured with rare skill and dedication to raise the quality of the vintage to the point where now Shaza would back it against nearly any of the second crews of Burgundy. His ambition was still to make a wine that would compare with some of the great and noble houses 
of the coat door. When it came to transporting this fare from the Cape of Good Hope to London, Courtney shipping lines ran a weekly refrigerated vessel on the Atlantic route. And I picked up your dinner jacket from the cleaners this morning, and I had Buds in Piccadilly Arcade make you three more dress shirts and a dozen new eye patches. Your others were all getting so tatty I've thrown them out. Still sitting in his lap, she adjusted his eye patch. Shaza had lost his left eye flying hurricanes against the Italians in Abyssinia during the Second World War. The black silk eye patch gave him a dashing, piratical air. Now Shaza smiled complacently. When he had first invited Bella to come to London with him, she had only recently turned twenty-one years of age, and he had thought long and hard before foisting the onerous task of official embassy hostess onto one so young. He need not have worried. After all, she had been trained by her grandmother, added to which they had brought the chef and butler and half the staff from the Cape with them. So she started with her own highly trained team. In three years, Isabella had built up a reputation in the diplomatic circle, and her invitations were sought after, except by those whose embassies no longer maintained relations with South Africa. Do you want me to cover for you while you sneak off with your Israeli pal for half an hour after dinner to build an atom bomb? Bella, Shaza frowned quickly. You know I don't like remarks like that. Joke, Daddy. There's nobody here to hear us. Even in private and in fun, Bella, Shaza shook his head severely. That had been uncomfortably close to the truth. The Israeli military attaché and Shaza had been involved in a courtship dance for almost a year now and they had gone far beyond the stage of flirtation already. She kissed him, and his expression softened. I must go and bath. She stood up from his lap. The invitations are for 8.30. I'll come and do your tie for you at ten past. Shaza had tied his own bow for forty years, until Isabella had decided that he was incapable of doing it. Shaza's eyes dropped to her legs. If your skirts get any shorter, mademoiselle, your belly button will be winking at the moon. You really must try not to be an old fogey. It's most unbecoming in one of the swingingest papas in the 20th century. She headed for the door, deliberately accentuating the movement of her lower body under the offending article of clothing, and Shaza sighed as the door closed. That's a load of dynamite with a very short fuse, he murmured. Perhaps in a way it's a good thing that we're going home. In September, Shaza's three-year ambassadorial stint would be up. Isabella would once more go under the control and discipline of Santan Courtney Malcolm S., her grandmother. Shaza realised that his own efforts in that direction had been less than totally successful, and he would hand over the responsibility with relief. Thinking of their imminent return to Cape Town, Shaza glanced back at the papers on his desk. The years in the London Embassy had been a political penance for him, when the Prime Minister, Hendrik Favut, had been assassinated in 1966, Shaza had made a serious miscalculation and backed the wrong man to succeed the Premiership. The result of that mistake had been that once John Forster had become Prime Minister, Shaza had been shunted into this political backwater. But, as so many times before, he had turned disaster into triumph. Using all his gifts and natural abilities, his shrewd business acumen, his presence and good looks, his charm and powers of persuasion, he had done much to deflect from his homeland the building wrath and contempt of the world, particularly that of Britain's Labour government and her Commonwealth, most of whose members were nations headed by black or Asian premiers. John Forster had taken these achievements into account. Before leaving South Africa, Shaza had been intimately concerned with arms corps, and Forster had offered him the job of Chairman of Arms Corps on his return home. Um, um, um. Arms Corps was, put simply, the largest industrial undertaking that had ever existed on the African continent. It was the country's answer to the arms boycott, begun by America's President Dwight Eisenhower and now being extended rapidly by other nations in an attempt to leave South Africa defenceless and vulnerable. Arms Corps, Armaments Development and Production Company, was the entire defence industry of the country under single management, state-sponsored to the extent of billions upon billions of dollars. It was an enormous and exciting challenge, 
especially since the multifarious companies that made up the Courtney financial and business empire were being well managed. During the three years of his ambassadorial duties, Shaza had allowed the management and control to pass gradually, in an orderly fashion, into the hands of his son Gary Courtney. And Gary was making an amazing success of it for one so young. But then Shaza had not been much older when he had become chairman of Courtney Enterprises. Then again, Gary had the day-to-day -day backing of his grandmother, Santon Courtney Malcolm S., the founder and dowager empress of the empire. He also had, working under him, the management team of experts that Santon and Shaza between them had meticulously assembled over the previous 40 years. This in no way detracted from Gary's achievements, not least of which was the fashion in which he had steered them all through the recent collapse of the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, which had stripped up to 60% of the value of some of the share prices. In some remarkable fashion that would have done credit to either Shaza or Santon, Gary had anticipated the end of the wild bull that had preceded the collapse. Far from being damaged or destroyed, Courtney Enterprises had come through the ordeal even more powerful and cash liquid, and in a better position to take advantage of the bargains that the market was now offering. No, Shaza smiled and shook his head. Gary was doing great things, and it would be bitterly unfair to come in above him again. However, Shaza was still a young man, not much over 50 years of age. When he got home, he would need something to keep his wits sharp and his juices flowing. The arms corps job was perfect. Of course, he would keep his seat on the Courtney board, but he could devote most of his time and energy to arms corps. Many of the subcontracts could be steered in the direction of the Courtney companies. Both enterprises might benefit enormously from this mutual association, and Shaza would have the additional pleasure and comfort of warming his patriotic ardour at the fire of capitalistic rewards. Isabella's remark that he had objected to earlier was directly related to his new appointment. He had used his diplomatic connections with the Israeli embassy to initiate and then pursue the idea of a joint nuclear project between the two states. Tonight he would be handing over another batch of documents to the Israeli attaché to be forwarded in the diplomatic bag to Tel Aviv. He glanced at his wristwatch. He still had twenty minutes before he must go up to change for dinner, and he switched all his concentration back to the papers in front of him. Nanny had laid out the Zandra Rhodes couture model and run Isabella's bath. You're late, Miss Bella, and I still have to do your hair. She was a cape-coloured, her hottentot blood mixed with that of most of the world's seafaring nations. Don't fuss, sir, Nanny, Isabella protested. But Nanny swept her off to the bathroom with as little ceremony as she had when Isabella was five years old. While Isabella sank with a luxurious sigh, chin deep into the steaming foam, Nanny gathered up her discarded clothes. Your dress is stained with grass, child, and your new panties are torn. What have you been up to? Nanny washed all Isabella's underclothes by hand. She would trust no laundry with them. I've been playing touch rugby with a hell's angel, Nanny. Our team won. Thirty. Love. You going to get yourself in bad trouble? All the Courtney's got hot blood. Nanny held up the torn panties and examined them with heavy disapproval. Long past time you were safely married. You've got a dirty mind. Now tell me, what's been happening today? What about Clonky's new girlfriend? Isabella knew how to distract her. Nanny was an inveterate gossip, and this was the time of day when she brought Isabella up to date on the doings and undoings of the entire household. While she chatted, Isabella made little murmurs of encouragement, but she was listening with only half her attention, and when she stood up to soap herself, she examined her body in the steamy full-length mirror across the room. Do you think I'm getting fat, Nanny? You are so skinny. That's why no boy married you yet. Nanny sniffed and went through to the bedroom. Isabella tried to be completely objective as she studied herself. Was there any way in which her body could be improved? Should her bosom be a little bigger? And did the tips point outwards at too acute an angle? Were her hips too wide, or should her bottom be smaller? After critical reflection, she shook her head. It all looked just about perfect from where she stood. 
Ramon de Santiago y Machado, she whispered. You will never know what you missed. And why did that make her feel so miserable? You're talking to yourself again, child. Nanny came back with a bath towel the size of a bedsheet and held it open for her. Out you get now. We're running out of time. She enveloped Isabella in the towel, and as she stepped out of the bath and vigorously began to rub her back dry, it was no good trying to convince Nanny that she could dry herself. Don't be so rough. Isabella had been making the same protest for twenty years, and Nanny ignored it. How many times have you been married, Nanny? You know well that I've been married four times, but I only been church just once. Nanny checked and looked at her with new attention. Oh, why are you asking about marrying? Did you find something interesting? That's why the torn panties. You vulgar old woman! Isabella avoided her eyes and snatched up her tie silk gown. On the way to the bedroom, she picked up the hairbrush and made one stroke through her hair before Nanny took it away from her. "That's my job, child," she said firmly. And Isabella sat down and closed her eyes, giving herself up to the familiar comfort of having Nanny brush out her hair for her. "Do you know? I think I'll have a baby, just so you will have someone else to fuss over and get you off my back." Nanny missed a stroke. Taken by the attractions of that proposal, and then she said sternly, "You get yourself married first before we talk babies." The Zandra Rhodes creation was an ethereal cloud of subtle colour, spangled with sequins and seed pearls. Even Nanny nodded and looked complacent as Isabella pirouetted in front of her. Isabella was halfway down the staircase on her way to a last-minute conference with Chef, when a thought occurred to her. And she stopped abruptly. The Spanish charge de fer was one of tonight's dinner guests, and it took only a second for her to rearrange the table seating in her mind. See,、si, yes, of course. The Spanish charge nodded immediately. She mentioned the name, and called、uh, Andalusian family. As I recall, the Marquis de Santiago y Machado left Spain and went、uh, to Cuba after the civil war. He had considerable sugar and、uh, tobacco interests on the island at one time, but <laughs> I imagine Castro changed all that. A marquez. The reply silenced Isabella for a moment. Her knowledge of Spanish nobility was less than elementary, but she imagined that a marquez ranked just below a duke. The marquesa Isabella de Santiago y Machado. With awe, she allowed herself to consider the prospect. And she saw again in her mind's eye those deadly green eyes, and for a moment she had difficulty breathing. Her voice was still ragged as she asked, "How old is the Marquez?" "Oh, he would be getting on a little now.、Uh, that is, if he is still alive, he must be in his late sixties or、uh, early seventies. He had a son, perhaps." "Oh, that I don't know." The charge shook his head, but it would be easy to find out if you wish. I will make some inquiries for you. Oh, that would be so kind of you! Isabella laid her hand on his arm, and gave him her most brilliant smile. Marquez or not, you don't get away from Isabella Courtney that easily. She thought smugly. It took you almost two weeks to make contact, and then when you had at last done so, you immediately allowed the subject to escape. The man seated at the head of the table stubbed out his cigarette. In the overflowing ashtray in front of him, and immediately lit another. The first two fingertips of his right hand were stained dark yellow, and the smoke from the oval Turkish cigarettes that he smoked incessantly had already tarred the air in the small room to a blue fog. Was that in accordance with your orders? He asked. Ramon Machado shrugged lightly. It was the only certain way of getting and holding her attention. You must realize that this woman is accustomed to male adulation. She has only to lift a finger, and men come swarming about her. I think you must trust my judgment in this matter. You allowed her to get away. The older man knew he was repeating himself, but this fellow needled him. He did not like him, and did not know him well enough yet to trust him. Not that he ever fully trusted any one of his operatives. However, this one was too self-assured, too disrespectful. He had turned aside the rebuke with a shrug, where another might have cringed. He had blatantly set his own judgment above that of a superior officer. Joe Cicero hooded his eyes; they were as opaque as puddles of old engine oil, startlingly black against the pallor of his skin 
and the silver-white hair that hung limply over his ears and forehead. Your orders were to make contact and to maintain it. With respect, Comrade Director, my orders were to inveigle myself into the woman's confidence, not to rush at her barking like a mad dog. No, Joe Cicero did not like him. His attitude was offensive. But that was not the only reason. He was a foreigner. Joe Cicero considered any non-Russian a foreigner, no matter what the concept of international socialism dictated. East Germans, Yugoslavs, Hungarians, Cubans and Poles, they were all foreigners to him. It infuriated him to have to pass on responsibility for so much of the section that he had headed for almost thirty years to others, especially to people like this. Not only was Machado a foreigner, but also his very roots and origins were corrupt. He was no scion of the proletariat, not even of the despised bourgeoisie, but was a full member of that hated and outdated system of class and privilege, an aristocrat. True, Machado disparaged and despised his origins, and used his title now only to achieve his goals, but to Joe Cicero his bloodlines were tainted, and his aristocratic manners and affectations were an insult to all he, Cicero, believed in. Furthermore, he had been born in Spain, a fascist country historically ruled by a Catholic monarchy, which was the enemy of the people, even more so now under the monstrous Franco, who had put down the communist revolution. He might call himself a Cuban socialist, but to Joe Cicero he stank of Spanish fascism and aristocracy. You let her get away, he persisted, after all this time and money wasted. He realised that he was being ponderous and heavy-handed, and he knew that his powers were failing. The sickness was already slowing his wits. Ramon smiled, that condescending smile that Joe Cicero hated so well. She is on the line, like a fish. She may swim and dive only until I am ready to reel her in. Again he had contradicted his superior, and Joe Cicero considered the last but the most poignant reason for his dislike of the man. His youth and comeliness and health. It made him painfully aware of his own mortality. For Joe Cicero was dying. Since childhood he had chain-smoked these rank Turkish cigarettes, and on his last visit to Moscow the doctors had at last diagnosed the cancer in his lungs and offered him treatment in one of the sanatoria reserved for officers of his seniority. Instead, Joe Cicero had elected to continue in service, to see his department securely handed over to his successor. He had not then known that the Spaniard was to be that successor. If he had known, perhaps he might have chosen the sanatorium. He felt tired now and discouraged. His store of energy and enthusiasm was all used up, just as only a few years ago his hair had been jet black and dense, and now was white, tinged only with yellow, like sun-dried seaweed, and he could not walk a dozen paces without wheezing and coughing like an asthmatic. Recently he had been waking in the night, drenched with those terrible night sweats, and when he fought for his breath he lay awake in the darkness and was assailed with terrible doubts. Had it been worth it? A lifetime of dedicated, painstaking work? What did he have to show for it? What little solid success had he achieved? For almost thirty years he had served in the African department of the Four Directorate of the KGB. For the last ten of those years he had been head of Station South, the division responsible for the African continent below the equator, and quite naturally most of his attention and that of his department had been devoted to the most developed and richest country of his region, the Republic of South Africa. The other man at the table was a South African. Up until this time he had remained silent, and now he said softly, I do not understand why we are spending so much time discussing this woman. Explain it to me. Both the white men at the table diverted their attention to him. When Rally Tabaka spoke, other men usually listened. He had about him a peculiar intensity, a charged air of purpose that held the attention of others. 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 All his life Joe Cicero had worked with black Africans, the nationalist leaders of the forces of liberation and the socialist struggle. He had known them all. Yoma Kenyatta and Kenneth Kaunda, Kwame Nkrumah and Julius Nyerere. Some of them he had come to know intimately, men like 
Moses Gama, who had been sent to a martyr's death, and Nelson Mandela, who was still languishing in the prison of white racism. Cicero placed Raleigh Tobacco in the forefront of that illustrious company. In fact, Raleigh had been Moses Gama's nephew, and Raleigh had been present the night the South African police murdered his uncle. He seemed to have inherited Moses Gama's tremendous personality and force of character, and he had stepped squarely into the wide gap left by Gama. He was 30 years old, but already he was deputy director of Amkonto Wisizwe, the spear of the nation, the military wing of the South African National Congress, and Joe Cicero knew that he had proved himself time and again in the field and in the councils of the ANC. He had the talent, the guts, and the verve to rise as high as any other man in Africa. Joe Cicero preferred him to the white Spanish aristocrat, but he recognised that despite their difference in colour and lineage, they were men cast in the same mould, hard and dangerous men, well versed in death and violence, adepts in the subtle shifting world of political power and intrigue. These were the men to whom Joe Cicero must hand over the reins, and he resented them and hated them for it. The woman, he said heavily, could be of extraordinary value, if she is controlled and developed to her full potential. But I will let the Marquez explain that to you. It is his case, and he has studied the subject fully. Abruptly, Ramon Machado's smile thinned, and his eyes turned flat and hostile. I would prefer the comrade director not to use that title, he said coldly, even in jest. Joe Cicero had learned that it was probably the only way he could penetrate the Spaniard's slick armour plating. I beg your pardon, comrade, Joe inclined his head in mock contrition. But please do not let my little lapse interrupt your recitation. Ramon Machado opened the loose-leaf binder that lay on the table in front of him, but he did not even glance at it. He knew every word it contained by heart. We have assigned the woman the case name Red Rose, and we have had our psychiatrists develop a detailed profile of her. The evaluation is that she is highly susceptible to skillful recruitment. She is uniquely placed to become an extremely valuable field operative. Rally Tabaka leaned forward attentively. Ramon noted that he did not interject question or comment at this stage, and he approved of that restraint. They had not yet worked together extensively. This was only their third meeting, and both of them were still evaluating each other. Red Rose can be placed in an emotional dilemma. On her father's side, she is a member of the white ruling class in South Africa. Her father is just finishing a term as his country's ambassador to Britain, and he returns now to take up an appointment as the chairman of the national armaments industry. He has enormous holdings in mining, land and finance. After the Oppenheimers and their Anglo-American company, the family is probably the most wealthy and influential in southern Africa. In addition, the father has conduits to the very highest levels of the ruling racist regime. The most important, however, is the fact that the father dotes on Red Rose. She is able to obtain from him, with very little effort, anything she sets her heart upon. This would include an entree to any level of government and any information of whatever classification, even that relating to his new appointment on the Armaments Corporation. Raleigh Tobacco nodded. He knew the Courtney family and could find no fault with this assessment. I have met Red Rose's mother, but she is on the other side of the political fence, he murmured, and Ramon nodded. Precisely. Shaza Courtney has been divorced from his wife Tara for seven years. She was an accomplice of your uncle Moses Gama in his bomb attack on the white racist parliament, for which he was imprisoned and subsequently murdered. She was also Gama's mistress and bore his bastard son. Tara Courtney fled from South Africa with Gama's child after the failure of the bomb plot. She lives now in London, where she is very active in the anti-apartheid movement. She is also a member of the ANC, but she is not considered sufficiently competent or emotionally stable for any but junior rank and routine assignments. At present she operates a safe house for ANC personnel here in London, and occasionally undertakes courier work or assists in the organisation of rallies and demonstrations. Her real potential value lies in her influence over Red Rose. Yes, Raleigh agreed impatiently. I know all about this, especially about her relationship to my uncle. But does she in fact have any influence over her daughter? It appears that Red Rose's sympathies lie heavily on her father's side. 
Again, Ramon nodded. At present, this certainly is the case. But apart from her mother, there is another member of the family who holds radical views. Her brother, Michael, who has a much greater influence on her. And there are other ways of turning her. What are those? Tabaka asked. One of them is the honey trap, Joe Cicero said. The Marquis, uh, uh, forgive me, Comrade Machado has made the initial contact uh, to that end. The honey trap is one of his many specialities. You will keep me informed of progress, Raleigh made a statement, and neither of them replied immediately. Although Raleigh Tobacco was an executive of the ANC and a member of the Communist Party, he was not, unlike the other two, an officer of the Russian KGB. Joe Cicero was, on the other hand, a KGB officer first and foremost, although his promotion from colonel to colonel general had been confirmed only a month previously, at the same time that the Moscow clinic had diagnosed carcinoma of both his lungs. Joe Cicero suspected that the promotion had been given to him merely to allow him to retire at the higher pension after a lifetime of loyal service to the department. Nevertheless, he was an officer of the ANC only after his loyalty to Mother Russia. His lines of allegiance were not diluted, and the ANC would receive only what information it was necessary for them to have. Ramon Machado's lines of allegiance were also clear-cut. He had been born in Spain, and his title of nobility was Spanish, but his mother had been a Cuban woman, slow-eyed and raven-haired. She had met Ramon's father when she was a young housekeeper on the Machado estates near Havana in Cuba. After the marriage, the Marquez had taken his beautiful commoner back to Spain. During the Spanish Civil War, the Marquez had opposed General Francisco Franco's nationalists. Despite his noble background and inherited wealth, Ramon's father had been an enlightened and liberal man. He joined the Republican Army and commanded a battalion at the Siege of Madrid, where he was severely wounded. After the war, the Machado family found oppression and discrimination under the Franco regime intolerable. The Marquesa prevailed on her husband to take her and her young son back to her native island in the Caribbean. Although they had been stripped of most of their Spanish property and possessions, the family still owned the Cuban estates. However, the Machado family found that life under the dictatorship of Batista was no great improvement on that under Francisco Franco. Ramon's mother was an aunt of the young left-wing student firebrand Fidel Castro, and one of his avid admirers. She became active in the campaign of agitation and intrigue against the Batista regime, and young Ramon gleaned his own first political convictions from her and from her celebrated nephew. After Fidel Castro was imprisoned for leading the gallant but abortive attack on the Santiago barracks on the 26th of July 1953, both Ramon's father and mother were arrested along with the rebels. Ramon's mother died under interrogation in a police cell in Havana, and his father died in the same prison only a few weeks later, of ill treatment and a broken heart. Once again the family estates were confiscated, and Ramon's only inheritance was the derelict title of Marquez, void of all property or fortune. At the time he was fourteen years old. The Castro family took him in and cared for him. When Fidel Castro was released from prison under amnesty, Ramon went with him to Mexico, and at 16 years of age was one of the first recruits to the Cuban Army of Liberation in exile. It was in Mexico that he first learned how to exploit his extraordinary good looks, and to develop his natural winning ways with women. By the age of 17, his companions had nicknamed him El Zorro Dorado, the Golden Fox, and his reputation as an irresistible lover was established. Up to the time of his father's arrest and death in Batista's prison, Ramon had been given the benefit of the finest education available to the only son of a wealthy aristocratic family. He had attended an exclusive preparatory school in England and spent two years at Harrow, so he spoke English like a native, as well as his own Spanish. During his school days he had demonstrated superior academic ability and had become proficient in the manners and pastimes of a young gentleman. He had a good seat on a horse, learnt to keep a straight bat, and cast a salmon fly. He was also a phenomenal shot at Spanish red-legged partridge or Mexican white-winged dove. He could shoot and ride and dance and sing, and he was beautiful. 
and when he returned to Cuba with Fidel Castro and the 82 heroes on the 2nd of December 1956, he proved his valour in the fighting which left most of the valiant band dead on the beaches. He was with the survivors that escaped with Castro into the mountains. During the years of the guerrilla warfare that followed, El Zorro was sent down into the towns and villages to practice his arts on scores of women, young and not so young, beautiful and plain. In Ramon's arms, they became enthusiastic daughters of the revolution. With every conquest, he became more skilled and confident until his band of female recruits contributed significantly to the eventual triumph of the revolution and the overthrow of the Batista regime. By this time, Castro was fully aware of the potential value of his young relative and protégé, and once in power he rewarded him by sending him to further his education on the American mainland. While he studied political history and social anthropology at the University of Florida, Ramon used his amatory skills to infiltrate the band of Cuban exiles, who, with the collusion of the American CIA, were planning the counter-revolution and the invasion of the island. It was largely Ramon's intelligence that pinpointed the time and place of the Bay of Pigs landing and resulted in the annihilation of the traitors. By this time, his extraordinary gifts had been recognised not only by his own countrymen, but also by their allies. When he graduated cum laude from the University of Florida and returned to Havana, the head of the KGB in Cuba prevailed upon Castro and the director of the DGA to send Ramon to Moscow for further training. While in Russia, Ramon exceeded the estimates that the KGB had made of his capabilities and his potential value. He was one of those remarkable creatures who could pass easily in any stratum of society, from the crude guerrilla camps of the jungle to the drawing rooms and private clubs of the most sophisticated capitals of the world. With the knowledge and blessing of Fidel Castro, he was recruited into the KGB. Given his connections, it was only natural that he should be appointed director of the Joint Committee coordinating Russian and Cuban interests in Africa. In this job, Ramon made a special study of the African socialist liberation movements, and he was responsible for selecting those organizations that were to receive full Russian and Cuban backing. He initiated the policy under which Cuba came to act as a surrogate for Mother Russia in southern Africa, and he was soon responsible for the supply of arms and the training of African resistance groups. And it was in that capacity he became a member of the ANC. In a very short time, he had visited all the African countries under his jurisdiction, using his Spanish passport and his title, posing as a capitalist investor and merchant banker with credentials supplied by the Fourth Directorate. He was accepted without reservation by the white colonial administrations, and was received cordially and entertained by everyone from the governors of Portuguese Angola and Mozambique to the British Governor-General of Rhodesia. He even dined with that notorious architect of apartheid, the South African leader, Hendrik Verwoet. When it became necessary to appoint a new station head for the African division to replace the ailing General Cicero, Ramon's qualifications and experience made him the natural choice. So, as he sat now in the back room of the Russian consulate in Bayswater Road, with the man he was about to replace and this black African guerrilla leader, his loyalties were as clear-cut as those of his superior. When Raleigh Tobacco said, You will keep me informed of progress, he was being naive. He would be informed only on a need-to-know basis. In Ramon's view and that of his government, the installation of this man and the organization which he represented as the ruling elite in South Africa was merely a single step along the road to the eventual goal of universal socialism throughout the length and breadth of the African continent. And naturally, you will be kept right up to date with this as with all other matters of joint interest, Ramon assured him in a tone of such total sincerity that the black man settled more comfortably in his chair and returned Ramon's smile. Very few persons, male or female, were immune to his charms. It gave Ramon a solid sense of satisfaction to see the magic work on even such a tough and uncompromising subject as this one.
Rally Tobacco was fully aware of the white man's smug self-satisfaction, although no sign of it showed on his face. There had been that flat spot in the Cuban's otherwise clear green gaze. Only someone with Raleigh's developed powers of observation would have noticed that. Raleigh had worked with these whites from Russia and Cuba for many years now, and he had come to understand that in dealing with them only one principle was fixed and certain. They were never to be trusted, not in any circumstances or even in the smallest detail. He had learnt to fake his acceptance, to give them false signals of compliance, such as the deliberate physical relaxation and the frank, trusting smile. However, he never forgot for one instant that they were white. Like most Africans, Raleigh was a natural racist and a tribalist. He hated these white men who patronised and condescended to him across the conference table with the same passion as he hated the white policemen who had fired the bullets at Sharpville. He had never forgotten for a single waking minute that dreadful day when under a blue African sky he had held in his arms the girl he loved, the lovely black maiden who was to have been his wife. He had held her and watched her die, and then before her flesh cooled he had thrust his fingers deep into the bullet wounds in her chest and made his vow of vengeance. The vow had been made not only against the assassins, but against them all, every white face and every bloody white hand, that had forced slavery and subjugation upon his tribe down the centuries. Hatred was the fuel on which Raleigh Tobacco's life ran. He watched the white faces across the table, and smiled and drew strength and resolve from his hatred. So, he said, you will take care of the woman. It is agreed. Now let us move on. Uh, a moment. Ramon lifted his hand to restrain him, and turned back to Joe Cicero. If I am to proceed with Red Rose, then there is the matter of the budget for the operation. We have already allocated 2,000 British sterling, General Cicero protested. Just sufficient for the preliminary stage. The budget will have to be upgraded. Red Rose is the daughter of a wealthy capitalist, and to impress her I will have to maintain my role as a Spanish grandee. They argued for a few minutes more while Raleigh Tobacco tapped his pencil impatiently on the tabletop. The African division was the Cinderella of the 4th Directorate, and every rouble had to be counted. It was degrading, Raleigh thought, as he listened to them haggle. They were more like a pair of old women selling pumpkins beside a dusty African road than two men planning the overthrow of an evil empire and the liberation of 15 million oppressed black souls. At last they agreed, and Raleigh found it difficult to conceal his disgust as he repeated, Can we move on to discuss my itinerary for the African tour? He had believed that this was the reason for today's meeting. Has the authorization been received from Moscow? The discussions went on into the afternoon. They ate a frugal lunch set up from the consulate canteen as they worked, and the fog of Joe Cicero's cigarette smoke dulled the shaft of sunlight through the single high window. The room was a high-security unit on the top floor, regularly swept for electronic listening devices and safe from outside surveillance. At last, Joe Cicero closed the file in front of him and looked up. His dark eyes were bloodshot from the smoke and the strain. I think that covers all points for discussion, unless there's uh, anything new. They shook their heads. As usual, Comrade Machado will leave first, said Joe Cicero was an elementary rule of procedure, that they should never be seen in public in each other's company. Ramon left the consulate by the entrance to the visa section, the busiest part of the building, where he would be less noticeable in the crowd of students and others applying for travel documents to the Soviet Union. There was a bus stop directly outside the walled consulate. He took a number 88 bus, but left it at the next stop and hurried through the Lancaster Gate entrance to Kensington Gardens. He lingered in the Rose Garden until he was certain he was not being followed, and then crossed the park. His flat was in a narrow side street off Kensington High Street. It had been rented specifically for the Red Rose operation, and although it contained only a single bedroom, the living room was spacious and the locality was fashionable. During the two weeks that he had been in residence, Ramon had managed to create an air of permanence. His personal chests had come from Cuba in the diplomatic bag, 
They had contained the few good pictures his father had left him, and other small items of furnishing, including family photographs in silver frames of his parents and the family castles and estates in Andalusia, when these had been in their heyday. The glassware and porcelain were incomplete sets, but they bore the Machado coat of arms, the stag and the boar rampant on either side of the quartered shield. His golf clubs were displayed casually in the corner of the tiny entrance hall, the plain leather Hermes bag well used, the discreetly embossed coat of arms almost obscured by wear. From what he had learnt about Red Rose, he knew that she would have an eye for such detail. He glanced at the venerable gold Cartier, another family heirloom, that felt unfamiliar on his wrist. He would have to hurry. His growth of beard was heavy and dark. He shaved it off quickly but carefully, and then showered and washed the stink of Joe Cicero's Turkish cigarettes out of his hair. He checked himself automatically in the mirror as he went through to the bedroom. He had been in peak physical condition when he had returned from Russia three weeks previously. The refresher course for senior officers at the KGB training college on the shores of the Black Sea had honed his body, and although he had managed to take little physical exercise since then, the lack was not yet apparent. His body was still sleek and hard, his belly flat and his body hair crisp and curly black. The scrutiny he directed at his image was completely without vanity. Face and body were simply implements, tools to be used to accomplish the tasks that he was set. He had no illusions about the fleeting nature of his physical attributes, but he worked to prolong it in the same way that a warrior cared for his weapons. Gym tomorrow, he promised himself. Ramon had the use of a martial arts studio in Bloomsbury, run by a Hungarian refugee. Two hours of hard work a couple of times a week would maintain him in fit condition for the Red Rose operation. His riding breeches were cavalry whipcord, and he wore a sage-coloured Treviera woollen shirt with a green tie under his tweed hacking jacket. His riding boots fitted him like a second skin, with a supple gloss of dubbed leather that flexed into perfect creases over his ankles as he moved. No amount of craftsmanship or money, only years of loving attention could achieve that effect. He knew that Red Rose was a horsewoman. In her world, horses were a major part of existence. She would recognise those boots as a badge of membership of the same exclusive and elite group to which she belonged. He checked his watch again. He had timed it nicely. He locked the flat and went down into the street. The rain clouds that had threatened earlier in the afternoon had dispersed, and it had turned into a glorious summer evening. Even the elements seemed to conspire to assist him. The riding stables were in a narrow mews behind the guard's barracks. The stable manager recognised him. As Ramon signed the register, he ran his eye down the immediately preceding entries and saw that his good fortune was persisting. Red Rose had signed for her mount twenty minutes previously. He went down to the stalls, and the groom had the saddle on his mount. She was a bay filly that Ramon had chosen with care, and for which he had paid five hundred pounds from his expense budget. However, she had been a bargain, and he knew that he would recoup the cost, and probably make some profit whenever he chose to sell her on. He checked the girth and harness, speaking softly to the filly, soothing her with hands and voice, and then thanked the groom with a nod, and went up into the saddle. On an evening like this there were fifty or so other riders in Rotten Row. Ramon walked the filly under the oaks, while groups of horsemen cantered past him in both directions. The girl was not amongst them. As soon as she had warmed a little, he pressed the filly with his toes, and she moved up into a trot. She had an elegant action, and he rode her like a centre, his superior horsemanship obvious even in that expert company. They made a striking pair and more than a few of the women they passed turned in the saddle to look back after them. At the park lane end of the row, Ramon turned and moved the filly up into an easy canter. Galloping was forbidden. A hundred yards ahead, a group of four riders were coming towards him. Two couples, young people, well mounted and turned out, but the girl stood out amongst them like a sunbird in a flock of sparrows. From under her riding hat, her hair undulated like the wing of a bird in flight and glistened in the buttery sunshine. When she laughed, her teeth were very white, 
and her colour was vivid from the exercise and the wind in her face. Ramon recognised the man riding beside her. He had been her companion on most occasions that he had observed Red Rose over the previous two weeks. Ramon had requested information on him from records. He was the second son of an extremely wealthy family of brewers, an effete upper-class playboy of the type known in London society as a Deb's Delight, or Hooray Henry. And he had been with her at the Rolling Stones concert four days ago. Since then, Red Rose had spent two evenings in his company, party hopping around Knightsbridge and Chelsea. Ramon had noticed that she treated him with a type of amused condescension, as though he were an over-affectionate St. Bernard puppy, and that on no occasion that he had followed them had she been alone in his company except when he drove her in his MG from one party to the next. Ramon was almost certain that they were not sleeping with each other, which was unusual in this summer of 1969 when sexual license was a raging epidemic. He also knew that Isabella Courtney was not a simpering virgin. In the three years that she had been living at Highfelt, it was documented that she had indulged in at least three explosive, if short-lived, liaisons. As the gap between them closed, Ramon transferred his attention to the horse under him and leant forward to pat her neck. There, my darling, there, he spoke to her in Spanish, while from the corner of his eye he was watching the girl. It was a trick that he had of deflecting his gaze, so that he seemed not to be looking, while he missed not the smallest detail. They were almost past each other, when he saw the girl's chin snap up and her eyes fly wide open, but he ignored her and rode on. Ramon! her cry was high and imperative. Wait! He checked the filly and glanced back with a little frown of annoyance. She had wheeled her own mount and was riding after him, and he let his expression remain reserved and slightly frosty, as though he resented her scraping acquaintance. She drew up beside him, reining her horse down to a walk. Don't you remember me? It's Isabella Courtney. You were my saviour. Her smile was uncertain and awkward. Men always recognised her, no matter how fleeting or distant their last meeting. At the concert in the park, she ended lamely. Ah! Ramon allowed his smile to bloom at last. Uh, the, the motorcycle mascot, <laughs> forgive me. Uh, you were dressed rather differently then. You didn't wait for me to thank you, she accused him. She suppressed the urge to laugh out loud with relief that he had recognised her at last. Oh, no thanks were necessary. Besides which, you had a rather urgent business elsewhere, as I recall. Are you on your own? She changed the subject quickly. Why don't you join us? Let me introduce you to my friends. Oh, no, 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 I don't want to impose myself. Please, she insisted. You'll enjoy them. They're good fun. And Ramon bowed slightly in the saddle. How can I refuse such a kind invitation from such a lovely lady? He agreed. And Isabella felt as though her chest was in a vice. She had difficulty breathing as she looked into those green eyes in the face of a dark angel. The other three had reined in and were waiting for them. Even before she came up to him, she saw that Roger was already sulking, and it gave her a vindictive little pleasure to say, Roger, may I introduce the Marquise de Santiago e Michado? Raymond, this is Roger Coates Granger. She noticed Raymond glance at her quizzically, and only then realised that she had made a gaff by using his title. He had not mentioned it at their first meeting. However, her momentary discomfort was forgotten when she introduced Ramon to Harriet Beecham and saw how Harriet reacted to him. She actually licked her lips like the cat in the television advertisement for pet food. Harriet was Isabella's best friend in London, more out of symbiotic consideration than out of genuine mutual affection. Lady Harriet was Isabella's entrance ticket to the inner circles of London society. As the daughter of a belted earl, she was welcome where Isabella, despite her looks and family wealth, would have been considered a nova riche interloper with a funny accent. Harriet, on the other hand, had found that wherever Isabella Courtney was, there swiftly assembled a superabundance of males. Beneath Harriet's plump, bland and colourless blonde exterior, 
flourished a ravenously amorous nature, and Isabella was happy to pass on her rejects to her. To her. To her. To her. Usually the arrangement worked perfectly, but Ramon was definitely no reject, not yet anyway, and smoothly Isabella interposed her horse between them and flashed a silent warning at Harriet. Harriet was enormously flattered. She knew that she could never aspire to become Isabella's rival, but it was gratifying to be treated like one. Marquez, Ramon murmured as they rode on, you know considerably more about me than I do about you. Oh, I must have seen your photo in one of the slosh columns, Isabella suggested airily, as she thought, God, don't let him think I've been that interested. Ah, the tattler, of course, Ramon nodded. His photograph had never appeared anywhere, except possibly in the files of the CIA and a few other intelligence agencies around the world. Yes, probably the tattler, that's it. Gratefully, Isabella jumped at the escape he offered her, and then set herself out to captivate him, without making her interest too obvious or oppressive. It was easier than she had anticipated. Ramon had a relaxed charm, a savoir-faire that fitted in with their group. Soon all of them, except Roger, who was still sulking monumentally, were chatting and laughing together as though they were old chums. As the dusk gathered, and they turned back towards the stables, Isabella kneed her mount closer to Harriet's and hissed at her, Invite him to the party tonight. Who? Harriet opened her vacuous pansy eyes in feigned incomprehension. You know damn well who, you randy little witch. You've been rolling your eyes and ovaries at him for the last hour. Lady Harriet Beecham had the run of the family house in Belgravia during the week when her parents were in the country. She put together some of the best bashes in town. Tonight, most of the cast of Hair, the current musical hit, pitched up after the show. They were still in costume and stage makeup, and the four-piece Jamaican band that Harriet had hired burst into a calypso version of Aquarius to welcome them. It bode fair to becoming one of Harriet's more memorable parties. It was so crowded that those couples with serious business in mind took up to twenty minutes to get from the ballroom up the staircase to the bedrooms. Even there they were forced to wait their turn. Isabella wondered sourly what Harriet's papa, the tenth earl, would think if he knew of the flow of traffic through his four-poster bed. In the midst of all the gaiety and laughter, Isabella was determinedly insular. She had found a perch halfway up the sweeping marble staircase, from which she could keep an eye on all arrivals at the front door, as well as on the action in the ballroom and the front drawing-room into which the dancing had overflowed. She steadfastly refused to dance herself, despite an incessant string of invitations to do so. She had been so icily dismissive of Roger Coates Granger's ponderous attention and callow humour that, discouraged, he had wandered away to the champagne bar on the terrace. By now he was probably pissed out of his gourd, she thought with gloomy relish. Such was the success of the evening that none of the guests could tear themselves away to move on to any other venue. All the traffic through the teak double front doors from the square was one way, and the noise and crush increased with every passing minute. Another group arrived squealing and shouting tipsy greetings, and Isabella felt a fleeting lift of her spirits as she saw amongst them a head of dark wavy hair, but almost immediately she realised that the man was too short, and when he turned so she could see his face, he was sallow and jowly. She actively hated him, whoever he was. As a kind of masochistic penance, she had made her single glass of champagne last all evening, and now the wine was flat and warm from her fingers on the stem. She looked around to find Roger and send him for another glass, but saw that he was dancing with a tall, thin girl with false eyelashes and a high, penetrating giggle that carried even to where Isabella sat. God, she's awful, Isabella thought, and Roger looked such a ponce slobbering all over her like that. She glanced at the ormolu and porcelain French clock above the door to the drawing-room. The time was twenty minutes to one, and she sighed. At half-past noon today, Daddy was having an important lunch for a group of influential Conservative members of Parliament and their wives. As usual, Isabella was to be the hostess. 
She should get some sleep to be at her best. But still she lingered. Where the hell is he? she thought bitterly. He had promised he'd come. Damn him. Actually, he had said that he would try to drop in later. But we were getting on so well, and it was as good as a promise. She dismissed another invitation to dance without even looking up and tasted the champagne. It was awful. I'm not going to wait a minute after one o'clock, she promised herself firmly, and that is absolutely final. Then abruptly her pulse checked and then raced away again. In her ears the music took on a sweeter, more cheerful note. The oppressive crowds and the noise seemed to recede. Her dark mood evaporated miraculously, and she was borne up on a wave of excitement and wild anticipation. There he was, standing in the front doorway. He was so tall that he towered half a head above those around him. A single lock of hair had fallen like a question mark onto his forehead, and his expression was remote, almost contemptuous. She wanted to shout his name. Ramon, here I am. But she restrained herself and set aside her glass without looking. It toppled over, and the girl on the step below her exclaimed as lukewarm champagne cascaded down her bare back. Isabella did not even hear her protest. She came to her feet in one fluid movement, and instantly Ramon's cool green gaze was on her. They looked at each other over the heads of the swirling, gyrating dancers, and it was as though the two of them were completely alone. Neither of them smiled. It seemed to Isabella that this was a solemn moment. He had come, and in some vague way she sensed the significance of what was happening. She was certain that in that instant her life had changed. Nothing would ever be the same again. She began to descend, and she did not stumble over the sprawling, embracing couples that clogged the staircase. They seemed to open before her, and her feet found their own way between them. She was watching Ramon. He had not moved to meet her. He stood very still in the giddy throng. His stillness reminded her of one of the great predatory African cats, and she felt a tiny thrill of fear, an exhilaration of the blood, as she went down to him. When she stood before him, neither of them spoke. After a moment she lifted her tanned bare arms towards him, and as he took her to his chest, she wound her arms around his neck. They danced, and she found every movement of his body transmitted to her own like a current of electricity. The music was superfluous. They moved to a rhythm of their own. As she flattened her breasts against the hard, rubbery muscle of his chest, she could feel his heart beating, and her own nipples swelled and hardened. She knew he could feel them pressing into him, for the beat of his heart quickened, and the colour of green darkened in his eyes as she stared up into them. She arched her back, a slow, voluptuous movement that made the ridges of hard muscle stand proud along each side of her spine. His fingertips traced them down, moving lightly over the crests of her spine, as though he were playing a musical instrument. She shivered under his touch and pressed her hips forward instinctively, welding them against his, and she felt his flesh harden and swell just as hers had done. For her, he was a great tree, and she was the vine that entwined it. He was a rock, and she the current of a tropical ocean that washed about it. He was a mountain peak, and she was the cloud that softly enfolded it. Her body was light and free. She seemed to float in his arms, and that was all of reality. They were alone in the universe, and transported far beyond all the natural laws of space and time. Even gravity was suspended, and her feet no longer made contact with the earth. He moved her towards the door, and she saw Roger mouthing something at her across the room. The tall girl was gone, and he was flushed with outrage, but she left him caught helplessly in the press of bodies, like a fish in a net. They went down the front steps, and she took the key of the Mini Cooper from her sequined evening bag and pressed it into Ramon's hand. He drove very fast through the deserted streets, and she leant as close to him as the bucket seats would allow, and watched his face with such a fierce concentration that she did not see or care where he was taking her. 
She did not think she could endure another moment without touching him, without feeling his hands on her body again. She found that she was shivering once more. Then, abruptly, he pulled into the curb and parked the Mini. He came around to her side with long strides, and she knew his need was almost as great as her own. She clung to his arm, and she could not feel the ground beneath her feet as they crossed the pavement and went to the entrance of the red brick house in a row of similar buildings. He led her up the stairs to the second floor. As soon as he closed the door of the flat, he turned to her, and for the first time she felt his mouth on hers. His face was as rough as shark skin with a new beard, but his lips were soft and hot and sweet as ripe fruit, and his tongue was like a live thing deep in her mouth. She felt something burst within her, and all reason and restraint were washed away on the flood. There was a sound in her ears like a gale force wind over a turbulent sea, and a madness descended on her. She twisted out of his embrace and tore at her own clothing in a frenzy of impatience, letting it fall around her feet on the polished wooden floor of the small hallway. He stripped his own clothing as swiftly, facing her, and she stared hungrily at every exquisite detail of his body as it was revealed. She had never dreamt that a man's body could be so beautiful. Where other men were gross and hairy, inflamed and knotted with veins, he was smooth and perfect. She felt that she could stare at him forever, but at the same time she knew that if she did not instantly feel him against her, she would scream aloud with frustration, and she flung herself against his naked chest. She pressed hard to him, and his body was firm and sleek and hot, yet the hair on his chest was unbearably harsh against the sensitive engorged tips of her breasts. She moaned and covered his lips with hers to prevent herself screaming, her desperate need. He picked her up, and she felt herself weightless in his arms, and he carried her to the bed, without breaking the clinging suction of their mouths, one upon the other. As she came awake, Isabella was aware of an overwhelming sense of well-being. She felt as though she might burst with joy. Her body tingled as though every separate muscle and nerve had a life of its own. For long moments she could not understand what had happened to her. She lay with her eyes closed, clinging to the moment. She knew that such a magical sensation must be evanescent, but she did not want it ever to end. Then slowly she was aware of the man-musk in her nostrils and the taste of his mouth that still lingered on her tongue. She felt the ache where he had been deep in her body and the heat of the pink rash that his beard had raised on the sensitive skin around her lips. She savoured it all, small pain transmuted into deep and fulfilling pleasure. Then, with a sense of fresh wonder, the thought imploded into her consciousness. I'm in love! And she came fully awake. Her joy was almost delirious. She sat up quickly, and the sheet dropped to her waist. Ramon, she said and the indentation of his head was impressed upon the pillow beside hers. A single strand of dark body hair was coiled like a watch spring on the white sheet. She reached for it and discovered that the sheet was cool, the heat of his body long since dissipated, and she felt her joy sink into despair. Ramon! She slipped from the bed and padded on bare feet to the bathroom. The door was ajar, and the bathroom was empty. Once again he had gone and she stood naked in the middle of the floor and looked around her with dismay. He was like a cat. His stealth was eerie, and a rash of tiny goose pimples arose around her nipples. She hugged herself and shivered. Then she saw the note on the bedside table. It was a single sheet of expensive cream-coloured paper embossed with his family crest. He had weighted it down with her key ring, the keys to her mini. She snatched it up eagerly. There was no salutation. You are an extraordinary woman, and yet when you sleep you look like a child, a beautiful, innocent child. I could not bear to wake you. I could hardly bear to leave you, but I must. If you can come to Malaga with me for the weekend, meet me here at nine tomorrow morning. You will need your passport, but do not bother with pyjamas. Ramon. She chuckled with delight and relief. All the lightness of her waking mood recaptured. She re-read the note. The paper was smooth and cool as marble, and had a sensuous feel under her fingertips. His skin had been as smooth, 
and her eyes turned dreamy and reflective as tiny, disjointed episodes from the night replayed in her mind. 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 He had been far beyond all her previous experience. With the others, even the most skilled and patient and perceptive of them, she had always been aware of their separate bodies, their divergent existences, of the deliberate attempts to please and to reciprocate. With Ramon there had been no division. It was almost as though he had taken over her mind as well as her body. They had blended into each other in some semi-divine osmotic process. Their flesh and their minds had become one. So many times during the night she had believed that they had reached the pinnacle together only to discover that they were still upon the foothills and before them towered an alp and then another and another, each higher and more magnificent than the last. There had been no end to it, only at last the oblivion of sleep so deep that it had been like dying and a resurrection into this new, charmed and joyous existence. I'm in love, she whispered in almost religious awe, and she looked down on her own body, amazed that such a frail vessel could contain so much happiness, such abundant emotion. Then she noticed her wristwatch lying beside her car keys on the bedside table. <gasps> oh, my God, she breathed. It was half past ten. Daddy's lunch! And she leapt to her feet and flew to the bathroom. On the wash basin, Ramon had placed a brand new toothbrush, still in its sealed plastic container for her. And this small kindness touched her out of all proportion. She hummed the lyric of faraway places through a mouthful of foaming toothpaste. She decided there was just time for a quick bath, and she lay in the hot water and thought about Ramon, and found there was a great void in her body aching for him to fill it. Enough of that, girl, she laughed at herself. With a wave of his magic wand, he has transformed you into a shameless little raver. She jumped out of the bath and reached for the towel. It was still damp from his body, and she pressed a fold of it over her mouth and nose, and inhaled the faint but distinctive aroma of his skin. It excited her all over again. Stop it, she commanded herself in the steamy mirror. You have to be at Trafalgar Square in an hour. She was just about to let herself out of the flat when she exclaimed again, and darted back into the bathroom. She rummaged in her sequined handbag for the Ovanon pills in their calendar-marked pack, and broke one out of its sealed compartment. She placed the tiny white capsule on her tongue while she ran half a tooth mug of water from the tap and then saluted her image in the mirror with the raised glass. To life, love and freedom, she said, and to many happy returns, and washed down the pill. Blood sports did not revolt Isabella Courtney. Her father had always been a hunter, and the walls of Veltefrieden, their home at the Cape of Good Hope, were decorated with trophies of the chase. Amongst the family assets was a safari company that owned a huge hunting concession in the Zambezi Valley. Only the previous year she had spent an idyllic fortnight in that enchanted wilderness with her elder brother Sean Courtney, who was a licensed professional hunter and ran the outfit for Courtney Enterprises. On a number of occasions, Isabella herself had ridden to hounds at Harriet Beecham's invitation. Isabella was a passable shot with the lovely little gold-engraved Holland & Holland 20-gauge shotgun that her father had given her for her 17th birthday. With it, she had shot snipe in the Okavango Delta, sand grouse in the Karoo, duck and geese on the Great Zambezi, grouse on the Highland Moors, and pheasant, woodcock and partridge on some of the great English estates to which she and the ambassador had been invited. She felt no offence at the sight of blood deliberately spilled, and in addition she had inherited her fair share of the family's gambling instinct. So the contest intrigued her. This was the second day, and the original field of nearly three hundred contestants had been whittled down to two, for it was a one-miss-and-out and a winner-take-all competition. The entrance fee was one thousand United States dollars a head, so there was well over a quarter of a million in the pot, and the tension was as hot and thick as minestrone soup as the American went to the plate. 
He and Ramon Machado were the only two remaining contestants, and they had shot level for the last 23 rounds. Finally, to break the deadlock and decide the winner, the Spanish judges had decreed that double birds must be taken from now on. The American was a full-time professional. He followed the circuit in Spain and Portugal and Mexico and South America, and until last year in Monaco. Now, however, the tournaments had been banned in that tiny principality after a mortally wounded pigeon had escaped from the stadium and winged its way over the palace walls to crash at last onto Princess Grace's tea table, spraying the lace tablecloth and the ladies' tea gowns with its blood. Prince Rainier had heard the screams halfway across his tiny realm, and that was the end of live pigeon tournaments in Monaco. The American was Isabella's age, not yet 25 years old, but his income was reputed to be well over $100,000 a year. He was shooting a 12-gauge side-by-side that had been made by that legendary gunsmith James Mantle almost a century ago. Of course, the weapon had been rebarreled and proofed to accommodate the longer modern cartridges and smokeless powders. However, the stock and action, complete with the engraved hammers, were original and retained the marvellous balance and pointability that old man James had built into it. The young American took his stance on the plate, cocked the hammers, tucked the buttstock under his right armpit, and pointed the double muzzles just over the centre of the semicircle of five woven wicker baskets that were placed thirty yards from where he stood. Each basket contained a live pigeon. They were the feral birds of the type that live in flocks in the centre of most large cities. Big, robust birds of variegated colours, bronze and blue and iridescent green, some of them with dark bands around their necks or patches of white in their wings. To ensure a supply of birds, the shooting club had built a feeding shed on the premises, a structure containing trays that were replenished daily with crushed maize and enclosed by drop sides that could be released by remote control and trapped the feeding birds within. Often a pigeon that escaped untouched from the killing ground would head straight back for the feeding shed. Many birds had been shot at numerous times before, and these were wily creatures who had learnt subtle little tricks to disturb the aim of the marksman. In addition, the bird handlers who loaded them into the baskets knew how to pluck a feather or two from wing or tail to make them fly an erratic, unpredictable course. The baskets were operated by a random mechanism, with a delay of up to five seconds after the shooter had called pull for the release of a bird. Five seconds for a man with sweaty palms, a racing heart, and tens of thousands of dollars at stake could seem like an eternity. The baskets were thirty yards out, and the effective range of a twelve-gauge shotgun was generally reckoned to be forty yards. Thus the birds were released at almost extreme range, and in addition the retaining circle was a mere ten yards beyond the line of baskets. The retaining circle was a low wooden wall, only eight inches high, painted white, which demarcated the boundary of the killing ground. To qualify as a hit, the carcass of the bird, or in the event of the blast of pellets tearing a bird into more than one piece, the largest portion of the carcass, calculated by weight, had to fall inside the low wooden wall. In this way, the shooter had to kill his bird as it rose from the release basket within the ten yards before it passed over the periphery of the killing ground. The baskets were fanned out over a semicircle of 45 degrees in front of him. There was no indication as to which lid would fly open at the command pull, and no way to predict which direction the bird would take once it was released. It could cross either left or right, bear directly away, or sometimes, the most disconcerting of all, race straight towards the gunner's face. Added to all this, the pigeons were fast, noisy flyers that could jink and swerve in full flight, and now the judges had decided that instead of a single bird, two pigeons would be released simultaneously. The American braced himself at the plate, crouching a little, left foot leading slightly like a boxer, and Isabella reached for Ramon's hand and squeezed it lightly. They sat in the front bottom row of the covered grandstand in the padded leather chairs reserved for contestants and club officials. Paul, said the American, and his Texan twang rang in the silence like a hammer on a steel anvil. Miss, 
whispered Isabella, please, miss. For a second, and then another second, nothing happened. Then with a crash, the lids of two of the baskets snapped open. Numbers two and five, half left and full right from where the American stood, and both birds, hit by compressed air jets from nozzles in the bottom of the baskets, launched into instant flight. Number two went straight out, keeping low and going very fast. The American swung smoothly onto him, mounting the shotgun to his shoulder, and as it touched he fired. Five yards out from the basket, the silhouette of the pigeon was distorted by the rush of pellets. Its wing beats froze in mid-stroke, and it died instantaneously in the air, and fell in a puff of feathers to hit well inside the ring and lie without further movement on the bright green turf. The American swung onto the second bird. It had broken away towards his right, a glistening streak of burnished bronze. But at the sound of the first shot, it jinked back inside the American's swing, so swiftly that he could not correct his aim in time. The shot was left of centre, but only inches out. Instead of slicing into heart and brain, the blast of pellets from the fully choked barrel tore away the bird's right wing, and the horribly maimed creature tumbled and fluttered, streaming a trail of feathers through the air. It struck only a foot inside the low white wooden wall, and a sigh went up from the watchers in the grandstand. Then, incredibly, the bird, one wing gone, pumped frantically with its remaining wing and found its feet. It tottered towards the wall, beating at the air ineffectually with one wing, uttering an agonised cawing sound in its puffed-out throat. The spectators gasped and rose to their feet as one, and in the centre the American froze with the empty shotgun still mounted to his shoulder. He was allowed only two cartridges. If he reloaded now and killed the bird with a third shot, he would be instantly disqualified and would forfeit the prize money. The pigeon reached the barricade and leapt weakly at it. It struck the wood with its chest only an inch from the top and fell back, leaving a splash of brilliant ruby blood on the white paint. Half the spectators screamed, Die! While those who had bet against the Americans screamed, Go! Go! Go for it, bird! The pigeon gathered itself groggily and leapt once more at the barrier. This time it reached the top and balanced there uncertainly, swaying back and forth. Isabella was on her feet, howling wildly with the others. Jump, she pleaded. Don't, oh, please don't die, pigeon. Get over, please. Suddenly the dying bird stiffened into a convulsive rigour. Its neck arched backwards, and it flopped from the wall and lay still and dead on the green lawn. Thank you, Isabella breathed, and dropped back into the seat. The pigeon had fallen forward and died outside the circle, and the loudspeakers above their heads boomed out the verdict in the Spanish phrases that Isabella had come to understand so well in the past two days. One kill, one miss. Oh, my heart won't stand the strain, Isabella clutched her bosom in a theatrical gesture, and Ramon smiled at her with those cool green eyes. Look at you, she cried, the original Iceman, don't you even feel a thing? Not outside your bed, he murmured. And before she could find a suitable reply, the loudspeakers interrupted her. Next gun up, number 110. Ramon stood up and while he adjusted the protectors over his ears, his expression was still cold and remote. He had taught Isabella not to wish him luck, so she said nothing more as he moved to the long rack at the gate on which his was the only weapon still standing. He took it down and broke it open and placed it over the crook of his arm and walked out into the bright Iberian sunshine. To Isabella... He looked so beautiful and romantic. The sunlight sparkled in his hair, and the sleeveless shooting vest with suede leather shoulder patches was tailored to his lean torso, fitting so smoothly that the butt of the shotgun could not catch on a fold or tuck of cloth as he swung it up to mount. At the plate he loaded the under and over barrels of the Perazzi 12-gauge and snapped the breeches closed. Only then he glanced back over his shoulder at Isabella, as he had done every time he had shot over the past two days. She had anticipated it, and now she held up both hands, clutching her own thumbs hard, 
and showed him her clenched fists. Ramon turned back, and his whole body went still. Once again he reminded her of an African cat, that peculiar stillness of the wild leopard as it fixed on its prey. He did not crouch as the American had done, but stood tall and lean and graceful, and said softly, Pull! Both birds bounded from the open baskets on wildly clattering wings, and Ramon mounted the gun with such elegant economy of movement that he seemed casual and unhurried. When he had been in Mexico with his cousin Fidel Castro, he had provided much of the funds of the embryo Army of Liberation's war chest with his shotgun in the live pigeon rings of Guadalajara. So he also was a professional, with the marvellous eye and reflexes needed for the job. The first bird was going obliquely out, speeding on shining green wings for the wall, and he had to drop that one first. He took it cleanly with a charge of number six shot from the fully choked bottom barrel, and it exploded in a puff of feathers like a burst pillow. He turned for the other bird, pirouetting like a dancer. This pigeon was a veteran. It had been shot at a dozen times before, and had kept low at basket level. The handler had plucked its tail unevenly, and although it was going at sixty miles an hour, it slid to one side and wobbled in flight. Instead of going for the wall, it came straight at Ramon's head, reducing the range to less than ten feet, and in doing so, making the shot many times more difficult. As it flashed towards his eyes, he had only a hundredth part of a second to react, and the extreme shortness of range would not give the charge of shot an opportunity to spread. It was though he were firing a single ball, and an error of a mere fraction of a minute of angle would mean a miss. He hit the pigeon squarely in the head with the full charge at point-blank range, and the bird disintegrated. Its body was blown away in a flurry of bloodied feathers, and only the two separate wings remained intact. They spiralled down and fell at Ramon's feet. Isabella screamed wildly and came to her feet. Then with a single bound she vaulted the barrier. Although the rangemaster called sternly to her in unintelligible Spanish, she flouted range discipline and ran out in long, denim-clad legs to throw her arms around Ramon's neck. The crowd was already excited and volatile from the tensions of the contest. Now they laughed and applauded as Ramon and Isabella embraced in the centre of the stadium. They made a splendid couple, almost impossibly handsome, both tall and athletic, shining with health and youthful vigour, and that spontaneous display of affection touched a chord in those that watched them. They drove into the city in the Mercedes that Isabella had hired at the airport. Ramon opened an account at the Banco de España in the main square and deposited the winner's cheque into it. In a strange fashion they shared a common attitude to money. Isabella seemed never even to consider price or value, Ramon had noticed that if a frock or a trinket took her fancy, she never even bothered to ask the price. She merely flipped one of her vast collection of plastic credit cards onto the counter, then signed the slip and crumpled her copy into her handbag without as much as glancing at it. When she emptied her handbag in the hotel room, she screwed the accumulated receipts into a ball and, still without reading them, tossed them disdainfully into the wastebasket or dropped them into the nearest ashtray for the chambermaid to dispose of. As a convenience, she also carried a fist-sized wad of banknotes crammed into her large leather shoulder bag. However, it was obvious that she had not concerned herself with the rate of exchange of sterling into Spanish pesetas. To pay for a cup of coffee or a glass of wine, she selected a banknote whose size and colour she deemed appropriate to the occasion and dropped it on the table, often leaving a waiter staring after her in speechless astonishment. Ramon had a similar contempt for money. At one level he abhorred it as the symbol and the foundation of the capitalist system. He hated to be dictated to by the laws of economics and wealth, which he had dedicated his entire life to tearing down. He felt besmirched and demeaned when he had to wheedle and haggle with Moscow for the cash with which to perform his duties. Yet very early on in his career he had become aware of the particular approbation that he earned from his superiors when he personally provided funds to finance his own operations. In Mexico he had shot live pigeon. 
While he was at the University of Florida, he had imported drugs from South America and sold them on campus. In France, he had run weapons for the Algerians. In Italy, he had smuggled currency and arranged and executed four lucrative kidnappings. All the profits of these operations had meticulously been accounted for to Havana and Moscow. Their approval was reflected in the rapid promotion he had enjoyed, and the fact that a man of his age had been selected to replace General Cicero as head of a full section of the Fourth Directorate. It had been quite obvious to Ramon from the outset that the paltry operating expenses that General Cicero had allocated for the Red Rose project were totally inadequate. He had been obliged to make up the shortfall as expeditiously as possible, and of course this little joint to Spain also provided an ideal opportunity to begin the second phase of the operation. That evening, to celebrate Ramon's win, they dined at a tiny seafood restaurant, jealously concealed from the tourist hordes in one of the back alleys where Isabella was the only foreigner amongst the dinner guests. The meal was an exquisite paella, cooked in the classical tradition and accompanied by a wine from one of the estates that had once belonged to Ramon's family and whose tiny production was never sold outside Spain. It was crisp and perfumed and had a pale green luminosity in the candlelight. "'What happened to your family estates?' Isabella asked, after she had tasted and exclaimed over the wine. "'My father lost them all after Franco came to power,' Ramon lowered his voice as he said it. He was an anti-fascist from the very beginning. And Isabella nodded with approval and understanding. Her own father had fought against the fascists, and she subscribed to the comfortable and fashionable belief of her generation in the essential goodness of all mankind, and the fervent, if rather hazy, ideal of universal peace, of which she was aware that fascism was the antithesis. She carried a ban-the-bomb button in her handbag, although it would have been crassly non-you to wear it actually pinned onto her clothing. "'Tell me about your father and your family,' she invited him. She realised that, although she had been with him almost a week, she actually knew very little about him, apart from what the Spanish charge had told her over the dining table. She listened with fascination as Ramon recounted a little of the family history. One of his ancestors had received the title after he had sailed with Columbus to the Americas and Caribbean in 1492, and Isabella was vastly impressed by the antiquity of his lineage. <laughs> we go back as far as great-grandfather Sean Courtney, she deprecated her own ancestry, and he died sometime in the 1920s. As she said it, she realised for the first time that if Ramon was the father, then her own son might one day be able to boast of such distinguished bloodlines. Until that moment, she had been content simply to be with Ramon, but now as she leant close to him and watched his eyes in the candlelight, the horizons of her ambitions widened. She wanted him as she had never wanted anything in her life before. And so you see, Bella, despite all of this, I am not a rich man. Oh, yes, you are. I saw you pay over $200,000 into your bank account this afternoon, she told him gaily. You can afford to buy me another bottle of wine, at the very least. If you didn't have to fly back to London tomorrow morning, I would have used some of that money to take you up to Granada. I would have accompanied you to the bullfight and shown you my family castle in the Sierra Nevada. But you've got to go back to London as well, she protested, don't you? A few days. I could have managed a few days, any sacrifice to be with you. You know, Ramon, I don't even know what you do. How do you earn your crust? Merchant banking, he shrugged dismissively. I work for a private bank and I am responsible for African affairs. We arrange loans for developing companies in Central and Southern Africa. By now, Isabella's mind was accelerating up to racing speed. Ramon's lack of fortune was fully compensated for by his august origins, and he was a banker. There would certainly be a place for a merchant banker in the top ranks of Courtney Enterprises, it was all beginning to look marvellously exciting. I would like more than anything in this world to see your castle, Ramon, darling, she whispered huskily. And she thought, I wonder how much a castle would cost, and if I could talk Gary into it. Her brother Gary was the chairman and financial head of Courtney Enterprises. He was no more proof to Isabella's charms and wiles than any of the other male members of the family. 
Like most of the family, he was also a terrible snob. A Marchesa needed a castle. He might just fall for it. But what about your father? Ramon asked. I thought that you had promised you'd be back on Monday. You leave my father to me, she said firmly. Bella, this is the most ridiculous hour to wake an old man, Shaza protested as he answered her telephone call. What time is it in the name of all that's holy? It's after six, and we've already been for a swim, and you are not old. You are young and beautiful, the most beautiful man I know, Isabella cooed over the international line. Oh, this sounds ominous, Shaza murmured. The more extravagant the compliment, the more outrageous the request. What do you want, young lady? What are you up to now? You really are an awful old cynic, Pater, said Isabella, and traced patterns in Ramon's chest hair with her forefinger. He sprawled naked beside her on the double bed. His body was still sticky, damp and salty from their dip in the Mediterranean. I just rang you to tell you how much I love you, Shaza chuckled. What a dutiful little mouse. <laughs> I certainly trained you well. He lay back on the pillows and slipped his free arm around the shoulders of the woman who lay beside him. She sighed sleepily and wriggled closer to him, nuzzling against his chest. Uh, how's Harriet? Shaza asked. Harriet Beecham had agreed to provide cover for Isabella's expedition to Spain. She's fine, Isabella assured him. She's right here now. We've been having a wonderful time. Give her my love, Shaza ordered. Oh, I will, she agreed. And covering the mouthpiece, she leant over and kissed Ramon full on the lips. She sends her love back to you, Papa, but she refuses to catch the London plane this morning. Ah, said Shaza, now we come to the true reason for all this filial consideration. It's not me, Daddy, it's Harriet. She wants to go up to Granada. There's a bullfight. She wants me to go with her, Isabella let her voice trail into silence. You and I are flying to Paris on Wednesday. Had you forgotten that? I am addressing the Club Dimanche. Daddy, you speak so well. The French ladies adore you. I am sure you don't really need me. Shaza did not reply. He knew that silence was the one sure way in which he could disconcert his wayward daughter. He covered the mouthpiece and asked the woman cuddled against him, Kitty, can you come to Paris on Wednesday? She opened her eyes. Oh, you know I'm leaving for the OAU conference in Ethiopia on Saturday. I'll have you back by then. She raised herself on one elbow and looked down at him thoughtfully. Get thou behind me, Satan. Daddy, are you still there? Isabella's voice floated between them. So my own flesh and blood are determined to desert me, are they? Shaza asked in his most injured tones. All by myself in the least romantic city in the world. I can't let Harriet down, Isabella explained. I'll make it up to you, I promise. You'd better, young lady, Shaza warned her. I shall remind you of your indebtedness at a very near future date. Granada will probably be deadly dull, and I'll miss you awfully, dear papa, said Isabella contritely, and traced her forefinger down Ramon's body, past his navel, and into the thick bush of hair below it. She twirled a dark curl around her fingertip. And I will be desolated without you, Bella, Shaza agreed, and dropped the handset of the telephone onto its cradle, and pushed Kitty back gently onto the pillows. I said, get thou behind me, Satan, she protested huskily, not get thou on top of me. Isabella drove as fast and as well as any man he had known. Ramon lay back in the leather bucket seat of the hired Mercedes and studied her openly. She basked in his attention, and every few minutes, when a straight section of road allowed it, she glanced sideways at him or reached across to touch his hand or his thigh. Unlike many of the assignments that he had been given over the years, Ramon did not find it difficult to act out his part with this woman. He sensed a strength in her, an untapped reservoir of courage and determination that intrigued him. He recognised that she was as yet unfulfilled and restless, dissatisfied with and rebellious against her easy, undemanding existence, ripe for excitement and challenge, searching for something, some cause to which to dedicate herself. Physically, she was immensely attractive, 
and he had no difficulty faking that tender concern towards her that was the hallmark of the accomplished lover. When he looked at her like this, it was a deliberate device. He knew the appeal of his gaze, that cold green contemplation like the stare of the serpent that mesmerizes a wild bird, and yet he enjoyed looking at her as at an exquisite work of art. Although he knew from her file that she had been with other men, he had learnt in these last few days that the core of her being was still untouched, and there was a strange virginal quality about her that aroused him. As with so many legendary male lovers, Ramon experienced that condition known as satyriasis. The name derived from those woodland godlings of Roman mythology, which were half man and half goat, and whose sexual appetite was insatiable. Although Ramon Machado was quite abnormally responsive to any woman, whether she was attracted to him or otherwise, yet it was unusual for him to be able to achieve orgasm. He was, in most cases, simply indefatigable, able to outlast a partner with even the most tardy libido, and to drive a normal woman on and on until she at last screamed for mercy. Then he was able to continue at the very first indication that she wished to do so, and he was so sensitively attuned to feminine sexuality that he would usually recognize that indication before she did herself. However, this woman was one of those rare creatures who was able to bring him on without too much difficulty. With her, he had already achieved true orgasm a number of times, and he knew he would again. It was, of course, essential to his plans that he did so. Driving up from the coast on that sultry summer's day, Isabella was as happy and exhilarated as she had ever been. She was in love. Now, there was not the least shadow of doubt in her mind that this was the grand passion of her life. There had never been, and there could not conceivably be again anyone to match him. She would never experience any emotion to exceed what she felt for him now. His presence beside her and those green eyes upon her made the sunlight brighter and the high, dry air of the Sierra taste sweeter on her lips. The wide plains and the mountains beyond were so like her own beloved land. They transported her back to the open horizons of the great Karoo, for they were the same lion-coloured earth and sepia rockscapes. Looking upon them, her mood was carried upwards even higher, and she laughed aloud with joy, and had to strive hard to prevent herself crying out, Oh, Ramon, my darling, I love you, I love you with all my heart and with all my soul for ever. Even in her giddy exhilaration she was determined that he must say it first. That way she could be doubly certain that what she already knew was true, that he loved her as much as she loved him. Ramon knew these mountains, and he directed her over dusty back roads to vistas of grandeur and beauty hidden far from the usual tourist routes. They stopped in one of the little villages, and he joked with the locals in their patois. He came away with a slab of the pink serrano ham, cured in the snow, a loaf of rough peasant bread, and a goatskin full of the sweet dark Malaga wine. Beyond the village, they left the Mercedes parked beside an ancient stone bridge, and followed the stream up through the olive groves into the foothills of the Sierra Nevada. While a bearded billy goat watched them in astonishment from the cliff above, they plunged naked into a secret pool of the river. Then, still naked, they ate their picnic lunch seated on the smooth black rocks above the water. Ramon demonstrated how to hold the wineskin at arm's length and direct a hissing jet into the back of his open mouth. When she tried, the wine spurted over her cheeks and dribbled from her chin, and at her request he licked the ruby droplets from her face and from her taut white bosom. This was such fun that they forgot about the rest of their lunch and made love, Isabella still perched on her rock, and Ramon standing knee-deep in the pool facing her. "'You're incredible,' she whispered. "'My legs are jelly. You'll probably have to carry me back to the car.' They spent so much of the afternoon beside the pool that the sun was on the tops of the mountains, turning the snows to incandescent gold, when they came in sight of the castle. It was not as large or as grand as Isabella had expected it to be. It was simply a gaunt, dark building, high on the slopes above the higgledy-piggledy pink-tiled roofs of the village. As they approached, Isabella saw that part of the parapet had collapsed, and that the grounds were overgrown and neglected. 
Who does it belong to now? she asked. The state, Ramon shrugged. There was talk some years ago of turning it into a tourist hotel, but <laughs> nothing came of it. The caretaker was an old man who remembered Ramon's family, and he led them through the ground-floor rooms. They were empty. All the furniture had been sold to pay the family debts, and the chandeliers were thick with dust and cobwebs. The walls of the hall were stained with rainwater from the leaks in the roof. It's so sad to see something once so lovely ruined by neglect, Isabella whispered. Doesn't it make you sad too? Do you want to go? he asked. Yes, I don't want to be sad today. As they went down the hairpin track into the village, the last of the sunset was so splendid on the mountain tops that Isabella recaptured her bubbling mood. At the inn in the village, the innkeeper recognised the family name. He ordered his two daughters up to change the bed linen in the front room and sent his wife back to her kitchen to prepare one of the Andalusian specialities for their dinner. Cotido madrileno, a stew of chicken and the spicy little corrido, sausages, on a bed of cabela de angel, noodles so fine that they deserved their name of angel's hair. In Spain, sherry is the drink of the people, Ramon explained to her as he filled her glass. It was cold enough here in the mountains to warrant a fire in the stone fireplace, and the light of the flames played over his features, making him even more improbably handsome. We always seem to be doing one of three things, she contemplated the golden wine in her glass. Eating or drinking or... She sipped the wine. Are you complaining? he asked. Gloating, actually. She slanted her eyes at him. Eat your chicken and drink your sherry, Signor. You're going to need your strength. She awoke with the sunlight streaming in through the open window and experienced a moment's dread that he had gone again. However, he was there beside her in the wide, soft bed, watching her with that cool, enigmatic expression. She felt another moment's chill of doubt, but as she reached for him almost diffidently, she found that he was already hard and swollen for her. Oh, God, she whispered joyously, you're incredible. No man had ever wanted her as much as he did. He made her feel like the most desirable woman in the universe. The innkeeper had laid a breakfast of purple figs and goat's cheese for them in the walled courtyard. They sat under the trellised vines, and Isabella peeled the figs with her long painted nails and placed the globules of succulent flesh between his lips. Her father was the only man she had ever done that for. When one of the daughters brought a pot of steaming coffee out to them, Ramon excused himself and went up to their bedroom. Through the tiny bathroom window he could see Isabella sitting in the courtyard below, and heard her voice and her laughter as she tried to make herself understood in her newly acquired Spanish. Earlier he had watched her swallow a birth control pill, as she stood beside him at the wash basin. She had made a silly little ritual of it, toasting him with the glass of water. Many happy returns! However, the pack of remaining pills was no longer in her toilet bag on the ledge above the basin. He went back into the bedroom. The bed occupied almost the entire floor space, and their luggage was crammed into the curtained alcove beside the door. Isabella's big squashy leather shoulder bag was thrown carelessly on top of her suitcase. He paused to listen again, and heard her voice faintly through the open window. He took the bag to the bed and began to unpack it swiftly, laying out the contents in careful sequence so that he could repack it in exactly the same order. He had searched her sequined handbag and checked the brand of birth control pills she was using on that first morning in the Kensington flat while she was still asleep. Later he had discussed them with the doctor at the embassy. If the woman discontinues treatment before the tenth day of her cycle, she will almost certainly experience a fertility backlash effect and become considerably more susceptible to impregnation when she ovulates, he had assured Ramon. The slim pack of pills was in one of the compartments of her black crocodile skin purse near the bottom of the bag. Once again Ramon straightened up to listen. There was no sound of voices from the courtyard, and he darted back to the window. 
he saw that Isabella still sat at the table, and that the innkeeper's black cat now had all her attention. The supercilious creature had settled in her lap, and was allowing her to tickle behind his ears. Ramon stepped back into the bedroom. There were seven pills missing from the separate date-marked compartments in the packet. From his inside pocket, Ramon slipped the identical Ovanon packet with which the embassy doctor had provided him. He removed the first seven pills from their compartments and dropped them into the toilet bowl. Then he placed the two packages side by side and compared them. Now they were identical in every respect, except that the second package contained only aspirin tablets cunningly coated to resemble birth control pills. He slipped the packet of placebo tablets into Isabella's purse and replaced her shoulder bag in the alcove. He pocketed the original package and flushed the toilet, making sure that the seven pills were gone before he washed his hands and went down the narrow staircase to where Isabella waited in the courtyard. In Granada, Ramon took her to the Corrida de Toros and exulted in their great good fortune that they were able to watch El Cordobe's work. Had not Ramon's father been a patron of this most famous of all matadors when he was a mere noveliero, they would never have procured tickets to the performance at such short notice. As it was, two tickets were delivered to their hotel on the morning after their arrival, and not only were they seated at the ringside directly to the right of the President's box, but also, before the spectacle, they were invited to watch El Cordobe's dress for the corrida. Of course, Isabella had read Hemingway's Death in the Afternoon, and she realised the honour of that invitation. Nevertheless, she was unprepared for the obvious depth of Ramon's respect as he greeted Manuel Benitez El Cordobe's, or for the semi-religious solemnity of the ritual of dressing. You have to be Spanish to understand the bulls, Ramon told her, as they took their reserved seats. And indeed she had never seen him so moved and emotional. His involvement was so powerful and infectious that she found herself as wrought up as he was. The trumpets of the entry parade sent thrills down her spine, and the spectacle was magnificent. The horses and the costumes encrusted with silver and gold and seed pearls, and the matadors strutting in their short embroidered jackets and skin-tight trousers that blatantly emphasised their buttocks and their bunched genitalia. Even the flaring coral pink and incarnadine satins of the capes glistened with the lubricious tones of intimate feminine flesh and served to underscore the essentially lascivious nature of the frenzy that descended upon the tiered ranks of spectators. When the bull surged into the ring, horned head high, the great hump of his shoulders swollen with rage, white sand dashing from under his hoofs, and his engorged scrotum swinging to the pounding rhythm of his charge, Isabella came to her feet and screamed with the crowd. As El Cordobis performed the initial passes, Ramon gripped her arm and leant close to her, describing and explaining the significance of each graceful evolution, from the pure elegance of the simple Veronica to the more complicated quite, 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 quite. 